Hey everybody. Uh, if you guys saw my last video, I was talking about uh, topsoil, creating topsoil, where it comes from, um, what constitutes healthy soil, healthy growing conditions, um, the mineralization of that soil, all that kind of stuff. Very, very fun. Uh, maybe I don't know. A lot of a lot of people had a, some really good questions and uh, uh, led me to think that I need to kind of go down an educational track for the next little while on um, soil nutrients independently. I kind of want to run through everything, uh, start from nitrogen and work all the way down through the miners. I think it would be really important for everybody to understand that piece. Um, and then also sort of understanding um, cations, um, looking at your CECs in, uh, on your soil test, and um, understanding sort of the pH relation and all of that. So right now, what I kind of want to talk about, and, and uh, I, I've been driving all day, um, so uh, I've had a lot of time to think about how I wanted this particular piece to go. And um, right now, I think talking about uh, CECs and understanding that piece of a soil test. So this is going to be two things. I want to talk about soil tests, uh, number one, why I, um, I've written about them a couple of times. If you guys subscribe to my blog, you've probably seen a couple of articles about uh, my opinion of soil testing. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to dig into the CEC side so you can understand that particular piece. So let's go number one with the soil test. Now, <clears throat> I'm not anti-soil test. Now you'll find I have to preface a lot of things like that. Uh, people have said, well, you're anti-aeration, you're anti-mechanical dethatching, you're anti-nitrogen, you're anti-anti-anti. I'm not anti-anything. Uh, I just believe that there are better ways to accomplish something where you don't give up something else. You're able to uh, be more inclusive with particular items. Now, for the most part, uh, soil tests, uh, the way that they have been used in the industry, is merely a recommendation for what fertilizer you should buy. Now, if you were to take two soil samples from your lawn, and send them in to uh, a lab that through a fertilizer dealer. And one you labeled bluegrass or ryegrass or some sort of turf for your region. And the other one you labeled garden or uh, alfalfa or something that was a crop. It would come back with two totally different recommendations for fertility. The numbers would end up being the same Hopefully, as far as the way the tests went, they, would, they should look identical, but you'll have two completely different uh, recommendations per the crop that you're applying to. And now, that, that's what I want to talk about, the crop. Yes, I did use those because crop is a bad word for lawns. The last thing that any of you should be doing anywhere is using your lawn to make money by baling hay. No, I mean, if, if you can do it, that's great. Um, but that's the nitrogen levels that are being pushed currently through taking these soil tests. And, and there's no testing for nitrogen unless you request it. Um, it's just, you know, you throw your four pounds out. Well, if you take the course of a season and uh, say in, again, anywhere, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. You know, when somebody says to me, Bermuda's a nitrogen hog, you look at the recommendations from a from a fertility dealer, it's four pounds of N. If it's St. Augustine, it's four pounds of N. If it's fescue, it's four pounds of N. If it's bluegrass, it's four pounds of N. It's just, just here, this is just what it is. I mean, maybe you'll fluctuate and see it at three or three and a half. Uh, if you live in an area where there's restrictions, they just automatically kick it down to those. It's two and a half. So there's not like a, necessarily a real science behind the recommendations when it comes to turf because soil testing as a whole has been meant for crops. Crops are based on removal of nutrients. So if you grow a field of corn, in general, uh, the rule is one pound of N per bushel of corn. So if you're trying to grow 250 bushel, which is huge, and there's places in Georgia that grow 300 and some places in the Midwest, uh, there's a pound of N, one pound of N per bushel per acre. And so you could break that all the way back down, 
right? And compare that to a lawn. So say you had an acre of grass and you followed the university recommendations or, or land grant university recommendations of four pounds of in. Well, you're gonna put down 160 pounds of nitrogen, well more than that really, 184 pounds of in across that property. It's kind of a lot if you think about it. Well, maybe 180 pounds. What well, doesn't really matter if you're if you're in that range. Um, that same ground then could grow 180 bushel of corn. Well, that 180 bushel of corn is going to remove nutrients. It's going to pull stuff up out of the soil in order to create you know a 13 foot tall corn stalk, plus growing the ears of corn uh, and all the nutrients that go up into that and then it's going to be harvested, stubbled, and maybe tilled back under the ground, returned to bare dirt. You never do that with your grass. Never once do you grow something up so much, cut away something, and then haul it off unless you are bagging your turf every time you cut it. If you're bagging and hauling it away, you're doing the ground a disservice. And in that case, yeah, you're gonna have to pound it with nitrogen to replenish everything that you're taking off, okay? So, and it's not just nitrogen, that's just what's, you know, that's the number one that's always recommended. It's nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. So, let me digress, I gotta go back to the soil test. I got off on the nitrogen tangent, I apologize. So think about that for a second. You've got your, your lawn cycles. You're cutting grass, you're putting clippings back down. You're returning everything back into a place where there's suddenly there's going to be heat on that spot. Microbes are going to come in, take over, start to chew that back up and return that material back to the ground. Now you will suffer some carbon loss, there's no question. As that starts to grind, there is some return to the air, but it's low by comparison of say, you cut your grass and then take it away and it goes to the dump. If you're just taking it and putting it back down into the ground, it's a different story. Okay, so you're, you're cycling that back down. So you're not losing the material. But the recommendation from that soil test that came back is just like a crop. Assuming that you are taking everything away and you're now replenishing that material. Okay, so soil tests should not be used for fertilizer recommendations. They shouldn't, they shouldn't. They're a roadmap. They're a roadmap for how your program should actually look. And if you're going to go through the process and take a soil test, which is great, I, I totally recommend doing that, but I don't recommend following what it says across the bottom of that page. And anytime you send through it, it says, well, based on your area and, and blah, 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 you're gonna need four pounds of this, a pound of this, and two pounds of this. Put it out through this particular material. And then that, that's just basically giving you a roadmap of what to buy, not actually what your soil needs. Because it's very rare that micronutrient recommendations are made beyond sulfur and magnesium. That's typically about as far as they go and you have to pay a little extra for that. So I send all soil samples. I also send all product samples and, and everything else that we do to uh, a lab in Kearney, Nebraska where uh, that was the second location of, of our facility back in 2009 is when we started out in Kearney before everything moved to Georgia. And uh, Ray Ward, who has been doing soil tests for most of his life, as far as I know, he has a, a wonderful lab. Um, I, I use them for everything. In fact, I sent the soil that I used in my last video that was in that cup has been sent off to that lab. I should be getting those results within the next week or so. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So, um, what I like about that is I can send in something and purely get the results straight up. There's no recommendations on there. It's just, here's your soil. Great. I see everything I need to on there in order to make decisions moving forward. Um, that's where it starts to get a little more complex. Now, what I want to look at, I, I kind of do the first three things. pH, vitally important. Okay, I, I need to know what the pH is because that's going to dictate what can actually be utilized by the turf. pH is super important. Organic matter. I want to know organic matter because of the release rate of the N that's in there. And I always test for nitrogen. Now, there's kind of two schools of thought on that. There is uh, some people who say nitrogen is stable. Uh, some people who say what's there 
today is gone tomorrow. There's, it's kind of actually both ways. Um, but the organic matter is going to dictate how much is actually naturally there that's occurring that's going to feed up into the plant over the course of the season. Now, I, as I mentioned before, about for every 1% of organic matter, you're getting 20 pounds of free nitrogen. So we wanna see that climb so that there's plenty of organic matter in that soil that's going to feed the plant on its own. But just by nourishing that organic matter, that's super important. So I want that to be like, that's the second thing I look at. So we've got pH, we've got organic matter. Um, we can calculate our nitrogen loads based on that organic matter, and then we're going to jump over into CECs. Now, CECs in general are, are going to just kind of tell what type of soil you have. Uh, the higher the CEC is going to be towards the clay side, the lower towards sand. Now, the numbers that are based in order to make that saturation uh, are going to be calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, uh, and you'll see hydrogen in there, but those are basically the sum of your cations. So it's going to read through that level. They're going to show you your hydrogen level uh, and what percentage that's taking up, your calcium level, magnesium, blah, blah, blah. So in a good healthy soil system, you're looking for a calcium and magnesium balance to equal about 80% of that total. That's pretty important. Um, if your hydrogen is too high, that means that your pH is super low. You've got really low pH and a lot of material is not going to be releasing. So you're gonna to have to adjust that pH up and usually that would come from liming and depending on, on how bad it is, you could choose which kind of lime or if your magnesium is low or if your cat, you, there's, there's different choices. Um, you know, gypsum, which is actually going to contain sulfur, uh, usually that's done in more alkaline soils to bring pH down and give it some calcium. Uh, dolmitic limestone, which contains magnesium and calcitic limestone, which is about 31% calcium. So depending on if you're magnesium or your calcium, what's off or on, you can pick what kind of lime you wanna use. Now, so there's more to that. The finer, the grind of the limestone, the lime that you're using, whatever the finest material you can possibly get is going to give you the most release year over year over year. So, but it still takes three years, even in healthy soil, to get the full benefit out of one season's liming. You'll see a pH change for sure, but there, there's still more that has to go on for that to actually saturate the soil, add to your calcium or your calcium and magnesium load in order to change things around. So these are kind of vitally important pieces. I don't want to see that hydrogen level high. I would like to see the potassium at a certain point, the calcium and magnesium equaling 80% of the sum total, and then it can be kind of adjusted in there. Um, but so you have to have those balances of cations. And it's important to see those because they are going to regulate the rest of the material that's going out. So soil testing has extreme value. And, and I love looking at reports and, and even just yesterday, yeah, the last few days I've seen uh, some colleagues and uh, some professionals posting soil reports online asking, you know, what do I do about this? What do I do? I love to chime in on those because I can kind of read through and say, well, here's going to be the fastest way that you can get to the best result in your turf. Now, I need to explain something. You know, I like visual aid, so let me just drink a little bit of this right here. You have a sum total, okay? Everything that in your soil, the exchange rates, minerals, whatever, fit into this 100% category. It can only ever be 100%. So if you're adding something, that means something else is getting kicked out. So if you have a cup and a faucet or, or a bottle of wine, if you feel like doing this, and you pour it into your cup, you'll never be able to make more cup. You will just make more mess. So the more you fill in with one item, is going to have to kick something else out of the way. You can't ever go more than 100%. So that holds true in anything that you do. If you are heavily nitrifying uh, the soil or your turf, you know, you're, that's all you're doing, you're filling it, your cup with nitrogen. That means everything else is getting kicked out. Well, it's the same thing when you look at CECs. If I've got some saturations that are too high, say my calcium is at 80, 85%, and my magnesium is at like two or 3%. Well, in that particular scenario, 
I actually have to chew through this in order to make the magnesium more available. I don't have to add it. Now you can, and you can give your plant a foliar application of magnesium to kind of make up for it in the interim, but this is gonna to have to be hit with some serious acids in order to break that calcium down. And as the calcium drops like this, the magnesium will automatically start to come up. Automatically, without even adding it. So you're just breaking away things with strong acids in order to get it back down to a level to where everything else kind of balances out, but it's always 100%. You're just chewing through something in order to let another level rise. So, a lot of information out there about soil testing, a lot of home kits, but once you get the home kit, then what do you do? What do you do? I would invite anybody out there who watches my channel and watches others, if, if you uh, are subscribed to Alan, uh, to The Lawn Care Nut, to Pete, uh, to Matt Martin, um, to anybody who's, who talks about these soil tests, if, anybody, uh, feel free to shoot them to me. Um, if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to help interpret some of those results uh, you know, without going into the pounds of whatever that you would typically get from a fertilizer dealer. So that's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I would love to help. Please send them through. You know how to get a hold of me by now, I hope. Answers at loncology.com. Uh, I am going to continue to enjoy my evening glass of wine after a long day on the road. And um, I'll talk to you guys all real soon. Cheers.